Hey, welcome to the Health Coaches Podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Howard Jacobson. Today, I want to talk about a trap that I see a lot of coaches fall into. And it's a very understandable thing because there's a lot of emotion at stake and it's very easy to get sucked in by our clients. But we want to avoid it in order to be useful coaches, in order for our clients to leave the session feeling like they've really moved forward and not just had an itch scratched. And the issue is urgency. When our clients come to us, sometimes they will be agitated in the moment because something just happened or something's on their mind and that's what they want to talk about. And their brain goes, oh, I got a coaching session coming up. This is a great thing to talk about. And there's a bunch of reasons why they might do that. One is being coached, especially if you're being coached by someone who's competent, can, will feel uncomfortable from time to time because you don't know what you're going into. You don't know, you know, the, the, the important things in life are kind of mysterious, like how do I move from here to there or what should I do in this situation or what do I do with my life or how like the big questions are not simple puzzles like a crossword puzzle where someone already figured out the answer and you're trying to figure out what it is. Right. Instead, there's this giant unknown and that can feel uncomfortable for our clients, even though they know it's good for them in the same way that, you know, you might think about going to the gym and doing a really hard workout like, yeah, that's what I need. That's good for me. But nah, if I have an excuse to stay home, oh, my shoulder hurts a little. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll not do the bench presses today. You can you can very easily come up with excuses because part of you really doesn't want to do it. So be aware that our coaching clients can also have that feeling like, nah, you know, if I have something else that's very specific to talk about that I know is finite and I can explain everything that's going on because I see the situation so clearly, right, in quotes, um, that can feel very comforting. Like, let's just do this. So that's one reason that our clients are sometimes inclined to come to us with these very, very specific urgencies that they want us to just we're going to drop everything we've been working on and solve this. Another reason is because of what Daniel Kahneman, who won a uh, Nobel Prize, um, well, I don't know, 20 years ago or so, uh, a behavioral economist calls the focusing illusion. And it goes like this. Nothing in life is as important as you think it is while you are thinking about it. Nothing in life is as important as you think it is while you're thinking about it. So whatever is on your mind at that moment starts to feel really, really important. So if, if the person has just, you know, finished a phone call with their spouse and their spouse is, is talking about dinner tonight and they're going to make that dessert that you're begging them, please don't make that dessert while I'm around because I can't resist and, and it, it makes me miserable when I see everybody eating it. And could we do something else? And could you guys maybe go out and have it or something? And that's like they're roiling and now they're going to get on the phone or on a video call with you. And that's all that's going to be on their mind. And that's going to feel like the most important thing in the world because it's happening right now. And the third reason is that things that upset us, that frustrate us, that feel like they transgress a boundary an ethical, moral boundary that we have a judgment about it. They shouldn't do that. Things shouldn't be this way. All right. When when our preferences spill into demands, and it's usually because we're stressed out, because we're under resources, we're resourced, we're overwhelmed. But when that happens, when it feel, when something happens that feels transgressive, it can feel like I've got to make this stop right now that the the emotional attachment to solving this problem overwhelms anything of even much greater strategic importance. So the mistake that coaches often make is to go with it. OK, great. Let's roll up our sleeves and solve this problem. Tell me more about it. And again, it's, it's a really natural thing for coaches to want to do. On the one hand, we love a nice, juicy problem. And the minute they start talking and telling us about their problem, our brains start thinking of solutions. And even if you're going to be a good coach and you're not going to jump in with advice or advice masquerading as questions like, have you thought about this or have you tried that? Which is, of course, advice suggestions. Even if you're going to be a good coach, but you're thinking, OK, let's solve this. Let's solve this particular issue. 
because that's what they want us to do. And we're good at it. And it's specific and it's finite and it can feel like a relief. And if we're like, well, I wasn't sure what I was going to work on in this session, they just told me, let's do it. Another problem is that a lot of people go to coaching schools where they're taught that their client sets the agenda. And I can't tell you what a dangerous idea this is enough that the client sets the agenda. What, what am I saying? Should the coach set the agenda? Do we know better than they? What, what's important? No. But the client setting the agenda is exactly the same dynamic as that person eating junk food or staying on the couch or neglecting to meditate or walk or do whatever they're going to do, because that's what's up in the moment. We don't honor the agenda of the client who is in front of us. We honor the agenda of two different people, the person who's paying us, which if you're working with individuals is the client who wants something and what they want is not a bunch of quick fixes to specific problems. What they want is a transformation. They want a new future. So the person who wrote you that check when you first had your intake conversation and you said, what do you want? Where do you want to get to? If you had a magic wand, what would the outcome of all this work be? That's the person whose agenda you pay attention to. And the second person you pay attention to their agenda is the future self of the client, that person that you can see. So when I'm coaching someone who's 400 pounds, I can literally see their 155 pound in shape body. I can see the smile on their face. I can see the energy and confidence in their step. I can see the self esteem oozing from their pores because I can see that future person. And that future person is always my client is always the one whose agenda I am advocating for the person in front of me. Not so much. They're the intermediary between the person who paid the money and the future person who represents what they told me they want. But I can see it in better detail than they can. And I can see it with greater confidence than they can because I've seen it before. They've never done it. Or if they did it, they slipped back. So they have even left less confidence as a coach, as someone who's helped people. I know that this is not only possible. It's like the pilot on an airplane. When someone comes on, they're scared to fly and they don't even think the plane will get off the ground. How could this even happen? The pilots done it a lot. They know they can get them there. So no, I'm not honoring the agenda of the client in front of me unless it meshes unless it integrates, unless it supports the agenda of the payer and the future client. So why else do we want to um, jump into this urgency in addition to it feels good to help the client in the moment and where we say, well, they're paying our bills, so whatever they want, I will do. The third is that we get caught up in it, too we start to think, oh, well, whatever is in front of us must be the most important thing. So Danny Kahneman had a uh, um, an acronym that he created called Wissiati, W Y S I A T I. And it stands for what you see is all there is. So when the client comes to us with this seemingly giant, urgent problem, we can get blinders to. So first thing is to be aware that this is going to happen that they're going to come to us in moments of great agitation and they're going to want us to laser focus on something. And I'm not saying never do it. I'm not saying don't do it, but I'm saying be aware of your options before you do it, because there are ways to you either to ignore it or to use it that will be much more helpful in the future. So the first thing to do is to notice your clients agitation, excitement, frustration, anger, rage, whatever, and notice how that triggers it in your own body. So you're not trying to stop it in them. You're trying to notice it and distance yourself from it in yourself. You're trying to be an observer of whatever that resonance is. And from that place, you can say, hold on, let's let's pause for a second before we get into this. I'm feeling a little bit of, of the agitation here. Um, can we just take a moment, get grounded, breathe, connect? And say it as, as as forcefully 
as you need to to not break rapport, but to establish that you're in control here, that you're not going to you know, leap on, hold, grab the handle of their speeding taxi and then just, you know, fly in the air trying to, to keep up as, as they as they go on this journey of destruction. All right, let's let's pause here. Let's take a couple of breaths. OK, I'm feeling it, too. I'm feeling the agitation, too. So let's both come back to a place where we think where we can think clearly. So that's just step one. Step two is to ask the client to remind you what their big goals are to reconnect them with the person who paid and with the future self that they want to transform into and have them say, remind me, let's 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 get the big picture here before we jump into this. What are we working on? And I would say about half a third to a half of the time after they said that. And I ask, so is this issue directly related to that goal? They'll say no. And sometimes I'll say, so do you feel like you are completely clueless about how to handle this? And they'll say, no, I think I can do it. I say, so great. So it's not directly related to the goal and you kind of know what to do. So would it be OK if we just put it aside and looked at what's coming up this week? That's really going to move you towards your goal again, a third or half of the time that thing they came in with with so much energy, it just dissolves. It just dissipates. Oh, yeah. You know, I was really upset about that. But no, it's not a big deal. Or, yeah, it's kind of a big deal, but you're right. I know exactly how to deal with this. I've dealt with it before. I just wanted to vent. Great. So they vented a little bit, not too much, and you weren't distracted or sidetracked. But there's another play that often comes up and it comes it comes up a lot in health coaching because everything is a way in. And it's that the um, the situation is a way into a bigger issue. And if we just solve this situation, we're wasting a huge opportunity. Ooh, I said tunity. I was British there for a second. <laughs> we're wasting a huge opportunity to look at a larger issue, to put this thing in some context, because if this is really bothering them, it's bothering them for a re for for a bigger reason. There's something else going on besides the thing itself. Oh, my spouse is uh, is being is making the dessert. How can I talk to them about not making this dessert? Well, what are the bigger issues that could potentially be involved in this? I can think of several. One is your communication with your spouse is an issue. And this is simply one little piece of it. So instead of figuring out how do I have this conversation, we can talk about, well, how do you solve things? What's the relationship? What's the power dynamic? What's the give and take? And, and like that might be a much bigger issue. <laughs> they might discover that, you know what, if they just moved out, they wouldn't have the urge to overeat at all, for example. Like, you know, and again, it's not our role, our job or our responsibility to tell people to get a divorce or to get marriage counseling. But as things come up, we can allow our clients to talk and see these things in this bigger context to see to reframe the problem in terms of something that actually matters and in terms of something that can provide a constant solution, because otherwise these little things, these little urgencies are going to keep popping up like mushrooms and you can keep cutting them off. You can keep cutting off the little mushroom fruit, but the giant fungal network under the ground is not going anywhere. And so every time it rains, it's going to keep throwing up more and more of these mushrooms. So we want to be able to explore the larger context. So one thing was, let's say it's the relationship. Another possible thing could be, why do I need my family to cook a certain way and eat a certain way in front of me? Maybe the issue is I need to work on my own ability to say no to things that are in front of me. Maybe our client like that's the issue is teaching them to say no, teaching them strategies for resisting temptation as opposed to demanding that the world be be utterly perfect. Maybe the issue is our client doesn't know how to fend for themselves. And so they feel 
completely vulnerable to whatever the outside world is cooking for them because they don't they don't have a plan. They don't have a bag of frozen veggies, veggies in the freezer and some parboiled brown rice that they can microwave and some sauce they can put on top of it and have a satisfying meal. Maybe they don't know how to shop for themselves and they bought a bag of, of, uh, of fruit and the apples turned out to be mealy and they think, well, I can't buy fruit. So I, what am I going to do for dessert? I'll just have to eat whatever everybody else is eating. And maybe there's a, there's a lack of fundamental lack of capability there. So what we want to do when we get to that big issue and we think that it is relevant, we can explore it. We can kind of zoom in to that particular issue. We can look at the details. We can look at the scenario. We can do a fast assessment to figure out what exactly was going on. But we're looking to transform it into a larger issue that is broader, that it's like, let's find the roots of the let's find the fungal roots so that we if we don't like what the what the mushrooms are putting up, we can remove the entire organism. We can we can change the system so that this is no longer a problem. So again, the three the three steps are slow down, breathe and ground, explore whether this thing is in fact a strategic issue. And if it is or if it's related to one work to trend to redefine it the way we do in the you section of the quick model question, understand the kinds of reframing questions that we ask to make sure that we get to something bigger and then solve from there. So one, you know, one of the potential solutions might be this isn't actually something that I need to deal with. My wife can cook whatever she wants. My husband can cook whatever he wants and it's not going to affect me. I have other things that I need to work on. This is a red herring. Hopefully it's not a red herring dessert. That sounds gross. But it's a it's a red herring. It's not what I need to be working on. It was just it was a distraction or we discover that it leads to this bigger issue of I can't control myself in the face of temptation. And that's what we got to work on. Right. Or it, it turns into it's a matter of interpersonal skill. If I'm going to keep having this problem because I'm uh, remember, I'm the, the client is upset they're, they're They feel like a norm has been transgressed or violated. They feel like their their defenses are up there in fight or flight to again to notice when that happens and to allow them to begin to discern on their own when they because if they go into fight or flight about this and bring it to you, they're going into fight or flight all the time and wasting their time on minor issues and treating them as if they're major issues because fight or flight turns everything into wissiati. What you see is all there is literally in fight or flight. Your eyes tunnel vision onto just what's in front of you so that you can make the best moves in a life or death situation. So helping them practice when they feel the judgment, the, the um, upset, the rage, the, the disappointment to breathe into that, to separate themselves from that, to be the observer of that in the same way that you're helping them to do it in the moment, in the coaching session with breathing and attention and, uh, and focus on the body. And then they can the big meta win here is not only do they not bring you these things in the moment, but they recognize in themselves, oh, this isn't as big as I think it is. This isn't as important. This is not going to give me the return on investment of my time, attention and worry than something else will. And instead of trying to solve problems, instead, I'm going to proactively create a future that doesn't grow as many of those problems. All right. I hope this was helpful. If you'd like to sign up for one of our upcoming trainings, you can find out more at wellstartcoach.com. And there'll be a little trailer after this that will explain and give you details about the next thing that we're up to. Um, take care. Peace. Be well, my friends.